So, so basically, the topic of today is called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. How to predict it, how to prevent it, and how to uh, manage it and treat it. Ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome it is a specialized area, so it is not commonly seen. But every now and again, even if you're, uh, if you're doing family medicine or definitely if you're doing obstetrics, you will see a patient who has been treated with fertility drugs and got overstimulated. You will also see patients who are spontaneously pregnant, have, they have not received any fertility drugs and have also developed hyperstimulation. The chances of spontaneous is very small, like le less than one in a thousand, but the majority of them are iatrogenic, means that we have given them medication. This is for disclosure for CME for the grants we had this year. And basically, I will discuss with you the prediction, the prevention, and the management. I will also discuss with you how to eliminate it, and then discuss the management in great detail. There are two areas in the management that are very important. One of them is prevention and management of arterial thromboembolism because the clots that happen with OHSS are not the typical uh, GYN obstetric problem that you have pelvic thrombosis and it, it, it throws some emboli to the lung. Most of those, the majority, two-thirds, are arterial thromboembolism. Most of them actually are either in the, in the middle cerebral artery or actually in, the, um, in, in, in some of the branches of the carotid uh, arteries. And as I will show you some of those cases as well. It's, been, it's become very common after in vitro fertilization um, uh, you know, became prevalent worldwide. And the reason for that is that with in vitro fertilization, you aim to achieve <coughs> multiple follicles. Once you aim to achieve multiple follicles, then you put the ovaries in an overdrive situation. Uh, and in some patients who are sensitive to, to, to hyperstimulation, they will go into the overdrive. And in other patients, they are not that sensitive, but we have given them an excessive amount of medication. So these are the two scenarios. Uh, you know, uh, P Professor Robert Edwards and Dr. Patrick Steptoe are the two pioneers of IVF. I had the privilege that Dr. Edwards was my mentor for 20 years, and um, he was the Nobel Prize uh, laureate for 2010 for medicine for his discovery of in vitro fertilization. Of course, should have been given many years to the prior to that. Uh, this was 30 years celebration. We uh, invited him. This was in the Library of Alexandria in Egypt, the famous Library of Alexandria, with 30 years of celebration with many of the uh, IVF uh, leaders worldwide. Uh, and this is also in the Library of Alexandria. And, and here I just want to uh, bring that up. He, this was his 85th birthday, again in, in the library. Uh, he was working on a paper until 4 o'clock in the morning. Then he, he lives in Cambridge in the UK. So he took the, the flight from Heathrow Airport at like 5 o'clock in the morning, arrived to Cairo, and then took a, a car to Alexandria. By the time he, he, he came for the opening lecture of uh, the uh, IVF meeting, which was in his honor, he was so tired. And he's usually one of the best speakers that you can ever listen to in your lifetime. He was so exhausted to the point that as soon as he uh, walked into the lecture, he could not remember his slides. This is the guy that literally captured millions of audience worldwide. I mean, has amazed us with fascinating lectures that are I'm not just even uh, you know, scientific, but also his flow and his thought and so on. Uh, of course, everybody in the room was, you know, has interacted with him usually as a student. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, most of us were his, you know, different levels of um, of his students at different point in time. So we told them just relax, come and sit down. So he came and just sat with us in the audience, and then go and have a nap and come in the evening and give it. So we made the opening in the evening, and uh, uh, but even in the evening he didn't uh, he, he didn't really live up to the expectations. Uh, and, and sadly, after that, health deteriorated. He passed away last year, uh, but, but at least he, I mean, he got every uh, prize in medicine and in science ever, but uh, he, he was keen on the Nobel Prize, and he got it in 2010, a few months after uh, this event. If I want to leave you with, an, with kind of one picture that you leave, I mean, usually we say that an hour after the lecture you don't remember much, so six months you would also, you would only remember very, very few things from the lecture. So if I want to leave you with one picture, this is the picture, this is the thing to go home with. I mean, one picture in the whole 60 minutes and the rest is details that are ir irrelevant to you. This is not where you want to be. This is what, what you, you want to avoid. You know, if, if you reach that point, basically you have failed, or we have failed. Um, th this picture is from, uh, from Israel, from actually from Jerusalem. <coughs> Joseph Schenker was the head of Hadassah Hospital. And this picture is from uh, Cairo, Egypt, um, and so on. This We put that on the cover of one of uh, our articles. 
you can see the over is normally 4 cm, 3 cm. The over here is 40 cm by 30 by 30 cm. The corpora lutea split on their own because of the tension and so on. Each of one of those is a hemorrhagic corpus lutea. Uh, and similarly here, you can see this, a 15 cm scalpel is disappearing uh, within the size of the ovaries. Again, ascites, they bleed, they, uh, and so forth, many, many complications. They don't hold sutures. One time my life had to actually twice, but one time somebody was, was, was over as close to that in, in, in London, and, and you try to suture, you put your knots and you're very cautious, and the whole knot comes in your hand. I mean, as soon as you finish it, you know, it, the whole thing comes in your hand, and you go on and on and on. So, so, so this is the ultimate disaster <coughs> situation here. Amazingly, the ovaries recover. I mean, they regress and recover, because, I mean, this is basically vascular, you know, stimulation by different hormones. So, so what is the issue or what is the, the main features of uh, OHSS? Two features. One of them is big overs, enlarged overs, and the other is third space fluid. Third space like where? Like ascites in peritoneal cavity and pleural effusion in the lung and maybe a few other spaces as I will show you. So this picture is actually, the one on the left is from Belgium, <laughs> uh, from Dr. Yang Garris, one of our collaborators, and you can see here pleural effusion clear, and you can see massive pleural effusion there with collapse of the lung. This is one of, uh, of our patients here. She, this was from January 2009, and I'll show you more picture of the same patient. This is the liver, and here is ascites. So again, ascites up here means that the whole peritoneal cavity is filled with fluid, showing you the extent of fluid that we have there. Again, this picture is from Belgium, and she's not six months pregnant. This is two weeks after her IVF cycle, and you can see the, the, the abdominal wall. You can also see on the uh, other side the vulvar edema, extent of vulvar. She can't pass urine, and what you're seeing down there is her catheter because she's constantly catheterized to be able to uh, avoid. So, so why would somebody like that, who, who suddenly was a, a regular 16-year-old, 100 pounds in weight, have this massive edema and massive uh, amount of ascites there. There are three classifications that I want to talk to you about. Not theoretical classification, they are very relevant. One is as far as the time is concerned. Two, as far as the mechanism, the etiology is concerned. Three, as far as the severity of the syndrome is concerned. So as far as the time is concerned, there is early and late. So what, does, what do I mean by early and what do I mean by late? So early means that the syndrome developed as a result of one of the drugs we give. Which one is the HCG? So like I was telling you a bit earlier, that we give two groups of drugs. One of them is gonadotropins, like the FSH that's made by the pituitary. This is the main uh, drug. And then when they reach certain level of maturity, we give them HCG to mature the eggs so that we're able to extract mature eggs. Otherwise, the eggs will be immature. So when you have the HCG, if, it, if the syndrome happens, if this ascites happens within three to nine days, we call that early, meaning that it is related to the HCG shot. If nothing has happened and the patient got pregnant from the IVF cycle or from the ovarian in the ovulation induction and the, 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 the syndrome happens 10 to 17 days, this becomes late. The difference is not just timing. The difference is the source of the HCG. The source of the HCG here is from the shot. So the good part means that the shot has a half-life, so it will eventually disappear. So the patients usually get better. The bad part is that if she gets pregnant, she makes her own HCG, so it keeps a perpetual increase in the amount of VEGF and the amount of the hormones that are incriminated in the pathophysiology of OHSN. So the timing is important. Are the majority of patients early or the majority of patients late? If you're stimulating harder, then you will get more patients that are early. If you're not stimulating harder but the patients get pregnant, particularly if they conceive with twins or triplets, then you can get late ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So this is the first thing, early and late. <coughs> the second thing is how severe, mild, moderate, and severe. All the patients that we stimulate have mild hyperstimulation. So we eliminate it as a cause for uh, or as part of the classification. So moderate and severe, moderate what and severe what? We take the three systems, the kidneys, the lungs, the GI. If they are affected very much, then it's extremely severe. If they are affected a little bit, they are less, and so on. But we try to, to make it unanimous worldwide so that we can compare. So that, for example, I say that I have a, an instance of 2%, you have a 3%. So we want to compare 3% of what and two. This was actually our classification that we did. We, we, we made the final classification with Dr. Abulgar in 1999. This was the fifth in a series of classifications. 
<coughs> it is amazing, actually, that here to, to, we are 2014, and there hasn't been another classification. I'm surprised that nobody else has come with a classification. Usually, things in medicine survive five years. After five years, you belong to the old school. So, 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 mm -hmm. so here, this is 15 years. But the, re the reason is, is that. Uh, you know, we, we followed a system there that we, we're looking by the systems and so on. So basically, in most of it, the patient feels uncomfortable, she feels some pain, some abdominal distension. If you do an ultrasound, you will find ascites, but if you examine her clinically, you don't feel ascites. It's not like the picture I showed you two minutes ago. All the labs are normal. What, mean, what do I mean by labs? The labs are the same. All of liver functions, kidney functions, hematology. So if the kidney function shows that she's not in you know, a severely hemoconcentration, liver functions do not show that she has elevated liver concentration, <coughs> and the hematology shows that she's normal, then this is good news. This is moderate. Moderate hyperstimulation, we used to treat it as completely benign, but now we're cautious with it, so I'll tell you what, how, how do we treat it differently. Severe hyperstimulation is a different story. We classified it to A, B, and C. C being the worst case scenario. So C meaning that the patient is actually going to the intensive care. So as far as the lungs, it's respiratory distress syndrome. As far as the kidneys, it's renal shutdown, usually from hemoconcentration, no perfusion, kidney shutdown. And then as far as the, the, uh, the thrombosis, uh, I, you know, I put here venous thrombosis, but it's really arterial thrombosis that we worry about. Venous thrombosis in this scenario are, are less common. It is not the commonest. That's, that's different from orthopedic surgery or from like GYN oncology where, you know, you, you, you do extensive dissections so you end up with, with, with the veins in the pelvis clotting. The two-thirds of the reported cases worldwide are arterial thrombosis. Typically, middle cerebral artery is the most dangerous one, resulting in strokes. You're talking about 22-year-old coming, having a bunch of fertility drugs for two weeks, ending with a stroke. So it's, it's a pretty serious situation. So this is C. So what is B and what is A? A is, I mean, you take the same systems. So, for example, her is that she's short of rest. She feels dysnea. I mean, it's dysnea at rest. I mean, she's sitting and, 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 and gasping for air. Oliguria, her urine output is less than normal, but she's still, you know, passing urine. She has nausea vomiting. She has diarrhea. Alternation of vomiting and diarrhea is, is a very you know, important sign. It's a clue. I mean, it's not a serious in its own right unless you lose electrolytes significantly. Of course, if you do ultrasound, you will see large over and you will see marked aside. But still, the biochemistry is normal. Liver function is good, kidney function is good, hematology good. B is a different situation. The ascites that was mild there become tense ascites. The ovaries that were large, like, large meaning what? Meaning more than 8 centimeters. So an ovary that's 6, 5, 6, 7 centimeters, that is entirely normal in that. I mean, the ovaries will be 8 centimeters because each follicle is 2 centimeters. So if you have four, four sitting besides each other, that's 8 centimeters. B is, 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 is more, so she has severe dyspnea, she has marked oliguria, but she's still passing urine, and now we're seeing a elevated hematocrit. What does elevated hematocrit mean? Above 50. So above 50 is important. Serum creatinine is high, liver dysfunction. Liver dysfunction has been described from over 20 years ago <coughs> from a group actually in, uh, in Fresno, California, and, and, and as maintained as, as a marker of severity. You can't do anything about it except support the third. So now I've covered you early and late, and I've covered you also, and 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 I've covered you also uh, mild, moderate, and severe. What about um, the uh, pathophysiology? L l you know, uh, as I was telling you, this is the cover of our book on ovarian hyperstimulation. So the book is, is, is one of my favorite books ever. Uh, but, I mean, basically because the topic is favorable, but also I picked the cover from the <coughs> New England Journal publication ten years ago. They, they made a significant discovery in 2003, from a, at the same time by two different groups, one in Germany and one in Italy. The, the, this is the reproductive system, so this is the ovary. If you take the, the wall of the ovary, you will, there will be multiple follicles. If you take one follicle and put it inside in the inset and magnify it, the wall of the follicle has granulosa cells inside it and has thicker cells outside. So the thicker cells, you know, make your androgens like what? Like testosterone and androstine diol. They pass from the thicker cells and go down to the granulosa cells. There is an enzyme known as the aromatase enzyme. So the aromatase enzyme here converts your testosterone to estradiol and your androstine diol to estrol. These granulosa cells are the source of all the hormones that we measure and that we, 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 um, uh, we monitor patients with. 
on the surface of each cell, there is a bunch of receptors. Receptors for what? For FSH. So when the pituitary produces FSH, their primary target throughout the whole body, they go, keep searching and wandering around until they go somehow find the ovary, go to the ovary, find the granulosa cells, and attach to the granulosa cell. So those have a FSH receptors. The FSH receptors, if they are normal, they respond only to FSH. If they are abnormal, we call them mutant receptors, they become responsive to other hormones. Responsive to other hormone means what? That hormones other than FSH could stimulate the, uh, the, the, um, the FSH receptors. The commonest hormone that they can respond to outside of normal situation is HCG. Where is HCG prevalent? During pregnancy, because HCG is the hormone of the pregnancy. So we always say that a pregnant woman never gets pregnant again while she's pregnant. Uh, so you can't have you know, pregnancy and then two months later another pregnancy. Why is that? Because basically the estrogen goes high, it suppresses your FSH and so on. But here the FSH is suppressed but she has HCG. The HCG goes and stimulates the receptor to produce more follicles. So if she is pregnant on her own, she's never seen fertility doctor or fertility, taken fertility drugs, this is spontaneous, normal, spontaneous pregnancy. And the HCG goes and stimulates the follicles, produces lots of um, uh, lots of follicles. Lots of follicles, the ovary is large. You do an ultrasound, pregnant woman, 22 weeks, big ovaries, and then the next thing is ascites. Means what? Cancer. She goes in, have laparotomy, next thing the ovaries are out for pathology, what are the ovaries? Follicular cysts, normal eggs, and so on. How much is this practice? Probably has been the standard practice definitely in the U.S. for like 20 years. Until reports after reports shown that those women do not have cancer. They just have spontaneous ovarian hyperstimulation uh, syndrome. Okay, rarely they respond also to TSH. So wh where is TSH high? In hypothyroidism. So patients with hypothyroidism have a, a, a high TSH. The TSH goes and stimulates that. Uh, there are three different major mutations, and there is about 800 polymorphisms for that. We actually wrote a uh, you know, big segment on the genetics of ovarian hyperstimulation. But the, these are the two situations, just pregnancy. So where is pregnancy excessive? Multiple pregnancy. Or moles where there's plus, plus and basically high ACG, high detiliform mole. So all those situations could make you produce multiple, multiple uh, follicles. So the treatment of that is, 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 to, is to figure out that this is not really cancer and not, not uh, you know, the ovaries do not need be removed. I think every year, with, with a huge, you know, obstetric volume here, every year, every two, three years we have one case here. Usually, I guess, admitted not here, admitted to the medical center because, you know, she has massive ascites and then somebody does something, finds she's pregnant as well, and then ascites and then the ovaries are 20 centimeters, so it, it is immediately equals to cancer. So she ends up, uh, you know, having laparotomy. So, of course, this is... Uh, I think this is one of the most significant findings in the um, in the last decade is the is the abnormality of uh, you know of uh, of FSH receptors. Like I said, two groups, one in Germany and one in Italy, uh, independently, and now they have collaborated and and have worked. Um, you know, Basur and Smiths are the main authors on on the New England Journal, and then several others have followed with discovery of several other mutations in uh, JCM. So any situation, you want to explain two phenomena. Why do the ovaries, who are 4 centimeters, become 40 centimeters? And why do somebody who is 100 pounds or 120 pounds suddenly have pleural diffusion, have ascites? Anything that you want to do, you have to explain. Why, why does this happen? Why, why do these two phenomena happen? We searched, actually, for number of years for every hormone that you have in the in the book to, to see its its variation in hyperstimulation versus not and the conclusion what most of them were irrelevant until <coughs> in the beginning of the uh, of the 90s uh, you know three different groups you know ours and two other groups independently found that VEGF was significantly elevated so let me tell you we give HCG shot but like you know pre pregnancy also produces HCG it goes and works on the ovaries multiple follicles on the ovaries produce a hormone known as vascular endothelial growth factor. Vascular endothelial growth factor has been known before gynecologists ever. Like I said, in the rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatologists were the first to correlate it with the effusion in the knees and so on. Also cancer you know, doctors, oncologists have found for many years that VEGF is the mechanism by which tumors invade and produce uh, tremendous fluid and so forth. The VEGF will go and work on the vascular system, opens up the, 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 uh, the endothelial cells of the capillaries, so they leak. They leak, they leak fluid, ascites, 
pleural effusion, hydrothorax, and all that stuff. So VEGF is the major cause. Why, why is that important? Because <coughs> modern treatment will have to depend on a reversal of the pathophysiology. We have not been treating those patients. We have been just symptomatically helping them out. So this is the same patient that I showed you earlier in from, to, from January 2009 showing the edge of the liver and then ascites here. So where is the, why is the ascites coming from? Because of the function of the VEGF on the uh, peritoneal membrane or on the surface of the ovaries. So this is the first part of the talk, which is what is the pathophysiology of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Second part is how to predict it. How can you guess it? How can you, uh, you know, suspect it so that you prevent it? From the history, from the monitoring and from the outcome. So from the history, two words. If a patient comes to you and tells you, I've been treated before with fertility drugs, and, and they give me the usual amount, like one shot a day of that hormone, and then suddenly the ovaries blew up, they admitted me to the hospital, they were, were started tapping me and all of that, this is a patient with a previous history. A patient who had hyperstimulation syndrome will have hyperstimulation syndrome again. Second is polycystic ovarian syndrome. The majority of the cases of, of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, if not all, happens in PCOS patients. What about monitoring? Two things, ultrasound and serum estradiol. So the more the serum estradiol jumps or, or is high and gets higher, the higher the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. And we have like normal curves and ranges and for all that stuff. Also the number of follicles. Typically, if you want to remember one number, 15 eggs. I mean, if you go above that, the chances are higher. What about the outcome? Of course, if the patient gets pregnant, she will produce her own HCG. So this will keep refueling the cycle. In addition, if she ends up with twins or more, then you have more than the regular amount of HCG. You would agree with that as well. So this is one of our patients active with polycystic ovarian syndrome six years ago. It shows you that we, we just started her stimulation, the lowest amount of medication, and look at the number of the follicles she, uh, she has there. Once the patient starts like that, you are in a non-winning situation. We had one, one patient that she had 45 follicles on one side and 45. Every time you give her like one ampule, she responds in a small amount of stimulation. I give her one and a half, she pushes all 40 eggs. So one, one, one ampule, she doesn't respond. She does not ovulate. She doesn't, you know, she, her estrogen remains like menopausal levels, like a hundred. You give her one and a half, which is the next step up, those 40, 40 follicles move like, like you know, like a Pretty scary, uh, very, very limited options to manage because, again, you either treat her or not treat her, and typically they have the, the other features, the hirsutism and all that, like we'll discuss next week. But this is typical polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, multiple follicles, uh, increased stroma and other features. All the follicles are peripherally situated and so on. You keep stimulating her at the usual dose. How many eggs you will have? bunch of eggs. Bunch like what? Like 30, 40, 50, 60 eggs. Easy, very easy. I mean, you give her 3 amps, 4 amps in a patient like that, you can easily get unbelievable. So restraint is important. But excessive restraint could also decrease your success rate. So, 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 so you will have to do a balance between you know, achievement of success versus achieve, you know, safety. This is the, 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 the same patient with the liver ascites, has twins. Uh, of course, she was, uh, you know, she was very, at the beginning very short of breath, very tired, very this. We even had to admit her for all that. And then once we told her that well, she had ultrasound and it showed twins, all her symptoms disappeared. I mean, you know, so so, um, so this, this is one of the work from actually from Professor Campbell and, and uh, Professor Tan from, from London a long time ago in 95 published in Human Reproduction showing you that the VEGF is higher in those women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. The difference also s becomes further away after we give the ACG. So I, I, today I'm not going to show you like curves and so on, but basically the numbers are close until you give the ACG, they go further away from each other. What goes further away? The VEGF level in PCOS versus non-PCOS after HCG injection. <laughs> Doppler, of course, showing you uh, an increased uh, vascular supply by the different measures that we have used in this particular study uh, in 95. How to prevent it? Again, there is two philosophies. The first philosophy is to primary prevention. Primary prevention means you don't go there. Second prevention, you've gone there and things gone out of control. You want to restrain it and, and, and get out of trouble. These are the two big pictures. So there's primary prevention and secondary uh, prevention. We published this book on ovarian stimulation. I mean, it specifically addresses the, um, the how can you, from the beginning, eliminate uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. The easiest thing to do is to do what? 
is to, to not to give her ACG. Stop. I mean, you're giving her, for example, some clomid, uh, we, we, you know, which rarely causes hyperstimulation, but then you find that she responded instead of two eggs or two follicles by 12 follicles. Just don't give her ACG. Let her, uh, you know, uh, let, let the cycle go to waste. Of course, what is the problem there? The frustration with the patient. She's taken so much medicine and now all going down the drain. Well, which is better, to waste a month and a cycle and so on, or to end up, for example, in the intensive care for three weeks? In a fertility 25, we're not talking sick patients that are, are coming with some serious disease. So withholding ACG was the commonest in, 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 in a survey we did in 1991. 91 was the commonest method used. Today, it is the least method used. Today, and I'll show you why in two minutes. People said, well, if ACG is a problem so much, why don't we just reduce the amount of ACG? Instead of giving them 10,000, we use 5,000, 2,000. And this was a paper from, uh, from London published in Fertility Sterility 25 years ago, to, you know, showing you that the dose of ACG makes an effect. So this is 10,000, this is 5,000, this is 2,000. If you start using 2,000, you will get no eggs. The follicles will be empty. Why they will be empty? Because the maturation of the follicle is dependent on the time and the dose of the ACG. The third way is, is, is something called costing. Costing means that you stop the fertility medications. You, 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 know, you continue your cycle, but you stop the fertility medication. You cost her there. It's been an idea that, that has been used for a while, but I'm using the costing to summarize to you what do we do in IVF in two minutes. So instead of, of giving you a whole lecture, how do you monitor patients with IVF, I, we put it into this slide. This actual slide was made by my um, collaborator, Dr. Garcia Velasco, uh, <coughs> from Madrid in Spain. So th this chart, the white syringe, is GnRH, which is Lupron. This chart, is uh, the green one, is FSH or HMG. What's the difference between HMG and FSH? HMG has two, FSH and LH. And then the third one is the HCG that we give to trigger ovulation. So all patients that go through IVF go, th go through, through different protocols. The commonest protocol, or the most successful protocol, again, for 25 years, has been called the long protocol. It's amazing, again, that something stays 25 years, but it has remained the, the, the most successful protocol for 25 years. So the patient starts from the cycle before. So, for example, we're doing IVF in October, so we start her from day 21 of, the septem of her September cycle. Day 21 of what? Of her menstrual cycle. We have nothing to do with the calendar month. So she starts on the lupin, which is the white series. She takes the lupin for how long? For one week. After a week, she bleeds, menstruates. After she missed switch, she comes with a bunch of tests, ultrasound and hormones to make sure she's suitable. If she's suitable, we drop the amount of lupron. So you see the lupron here, you know, that much, that is now le less lupron. And then we start the usual medication, which is either FSH or HMG. Once we start with that, we monitor them. We give them five days break. This is the only break they were going to get. And then after five days, they come from monitoring. And then we usually monitor them every day or every other day from the fifth day until they reach a maturity size. Maturity of what? Of follicles of 18 millimeters because the eggs themselves, we can see them. So here it is. We monitor them and the estrogen keeps jumping higher. So if I ask you what is the normal estrogen, like you've run a test today on any patients that you've seen in the morning, what's the normal estrogen? You'll find they're 200, 300, 100, and so on. So for those patients, we take 4,000. Once they cross the 4,000, we stop that many. So 4,000 is a significant number. It's about 15, 20 times what we do if we measure all the people in, in the room today, their estrogen more, it will be 180, 220, 225, and so on. So 4,000 is significant. 4,000, we quit. We stop. We don't give any more of HMG, but we continue the lupron. Why do we continue the lupron? Because on those high responders, they can spontaneously ovulate. So the lupron helps in suppressing the system. It's a small amount of lupron, different from what we, we do in endometriosis. Endometriosis you use like 3.75. Here you, you use really half a milligram of lupron per day. And then after the menses, we drop it to quarter milligram. So this is 0 0.5, this is 0 0.25, and you can drop it even more. So after 4,000, we quit, but we monitor them very carefully. Their estrogen will start going down. So here, their estrogen was like 4,000, 7,000, 20,000, and so on. And, and, but, but then when it starts going down, until it drops below 3,000, then we give them a shot of ACG to trigger the ovulation and then pick the eggs 36 hours later. So this process is costing, I've really used it for you here to give you an outline of, um, mainly of the IPA. It is now the commonest method used to prevent ovarian hyperstimulation because you can still salvage the cycle without withholding the HCG, which is uh, canceling it altogether. 
So when do we start the costing? When the estrogen goes above uh, 4,000, when she has more than 15 eggs, or, or you know, basically between 15 and 30. If the patient has 40, 50 follicles, my personal feeling, to quit altogether. Because this is the dangerous, this is the red lights. I mean, this, this is the third red, the red light. This is not like the first red light where you've passed two already. So, so if the patient has 40, 50 on each side, most likely you will not win. So it is better to quit. We measure the estrogen definitely on a daily basis. One of the mishaps that happen with those patients, the estrogen suddenly drops. I mean, it is like 7,000, and then in two days become 650. You drop it by 90%. You have zero control over that because the VEGF drops, and, and, and also all the stimulation drops, the estrogen suddenly drops down. If it drops down, pregnancy rate drops down from 50% down to 3, 4, 5%. Basically, it drops down by 95. You can rescue that by giving her additional FSH at the time. If the estrogen is too, too high, you can give them an antagonist together besides the agonist. The antagonist is a different hormone that works uh, quickly. And then you trigger ovulation. If you have given them Lupron during the stimulation, which is the general age, you have to give them HCG to trigger ovulation. If you have used the protocol in which you did not use Lupron during the stimulation, then you can give them Lupron itself to trigger ovulation. So a small amount of Lupron can do that. And, and so on, you can give them even up to half a milligram, and you give it twice, eight hours apart, and still do your eggs. But after the estrogen has dropped down in three times. These are the safety criteria. We, we cancel if the estrogen is above 7,000. We cancel if she has more than, like what we suspect to be more than 30 eggs. Why? Because there is just, it's high risk. I mean, can you do it? Of course you can do it. And there is, you know, one, one of our uh, former fellows, uh, Hany, I, I send him for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to, to a group in Chicago. So he went there, he texted me the first day, they had about 20 patients. The, the group just does pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. They don't do infertility or IVF, they're not gynecologists, they're simply geneticists. So he sat down and he looked at the patients and so on. The first patient had 38 eggs, second patient 47 eggs, third patient 32 eggs. So he called me, he said, so, I mean, who's doing the, I mean, like, we stimulate for six eggs and eight eggs and 10 eggs and the other guys, the average eggs in the morning was like 36 eggs. So this is the average, this is not the, the peak. So he said, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm totally confused. I mean, what it is. So it, it really, this is totally different philosophies. But, <coughs> you know, the, the patients, uh, the different va variation, but no question that if you use, if, if you go high there, you will get a higher proportion of severe OHSAs. Could you be lucky? Yes. Could you get away with 100%? Zero chance that you get away with 100%. But you definitely have a higher proportion. I mean, because, like I said, I mean, it is 100% HMG dependent. The whole story is 100% HMG. The more shots you give her, the more follicles she makes at one time. Once you go to 40, 50, 60 follicles, definitely you have a higher chance. Could you have 60 follicles and don't? Yes, of course you can. I mean, no, I mean, no, not everybody that has a heart attack, you know, uh, you know, dies. So not everybody that has, you know, this disease will go. Also, the length of costing, very debatable issues. How many days can you stop? Mm -hmm. And then the estrogen drops. So these are the four criteria that we look by for costing. If you have used the cycle in which you have not used GnRH, then you can use Lupron itself or GnRH to trigger ovulation. So keep that in mind. The GnRH alone could be given to trigger ovulation, but the problem will be you pay a price in what we call the luteal phase. The luteal phase will be deficient, so many people go back and give those patients HCG to support the luteal phase. I mean, there is lots of studies here. I will not um, go much into those today. And then there is a recombinant human LH. The recombinant human LH is basically, in normal women, how do they ovulate? LH. I mean, nobody has HCG to ovulate. Actually, the monkeys have HCGs. The, 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 uh, we had a monkey colony here, and, and one of the, the major the, the discoveries here is that the monkey pituitary makes HCG as opposed to, to the human pituitary, which is makes it. This was actually you know, reported by, uh, confirmed, uh, let's, uh, shall I say, by the group in, in, um, in South Alabama on the monkey colonies that we had. We were doing stimulation, and, and basically we, they found HCG receptors in the ovaries, not LH receptors, so they thought, well, if they have HCG receptors, then they possibly have also HCG produced by the pituitary, and that was confirmed as well. But LH is the original hormone. 
So why don't we use LH instead of ACG? ACG is much more potent, and I, I, you know, I remember last year I gave you a talk on the different gonadotropins and so on. ACG, the sugar is different from the LH, so it stays longer and more potent. The sugar part is different, has four branches and so on. We'll cover it, you know, God willing, next month in, in, in another talk. But the LH is an expensive drug. The ACG is cheap. It, it, historically, it was extracted from urine of pregnant women, like HMG was extracted from urine of menopausal women. So the ACG is common, it's cheap, available. The LH is, 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 is recombinant, pretty expensive drug to make. And to use a high dose, high enough to trigger ovulation, the LH is definitely one of the most expensive drugs that you can use for that. If you use it at a lower dose, the pregnancy rate will be lower. The hyperstimulation is zero, but the pregnancy rate is, or close to zero, but the pregnancy rate is much lower. What about ovarian drilling? <clears throat> I'm not talking about ovarian drilling to induce ovulation as a method to conquer infertility. Here, ovarian drilling is, is precisely used as a method to prevent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in women who have previously had hyper ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. That was <clears throat> severe enough to, to, get, to make them admitted to the uh, hospital. So this was a study actually from, uh, from Cardiff in Wales by, by, by Bob Shaw, who was the president of the Royal College in England at the time, and he had 50 women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. 25 had, uh, had previously uh, undergone OHSS and cancelled their cycles because of OHSS, and, and, and 25 had the same amount of polycystic ovarian syndrome features, but, and, and he did cautery, electrocautery on half of them, the ones that, um, and, and then he did not do uh, electrocautery on the other 25, <coughs> and the, the pregnancy rate was the same, uh, as you can see here, the miscarriage rate is the same, but definitely much lower chance of hyperstimulation syndrome uh, in patients who, who had electrocautery. So electrocautery does work. It works by different mechanisms. Again, that's a topic uh, that we could cover separate. But I'm talking here ovarian drilling for prevention of OHSS. I'm not talking ovarian drilling for induction of monofollicular ovulation in women who do not ovulate with polycystic ovarian syndrome. You can preserve the eggs when we use that frequently, that if, you know, especially now you can do vitrification. We do embryo vitrification, but, but even without vitrification, if you do slow freezing, the, you can vitrify. What will that help? It will help with the late ovarian hyperstimulation. Remember I said there is early late, so the whole idea from late is that this came from the HCG. If you, if you instead of, of, uh, of putting the embryos back and getting pregnancy, you freeze those embryos and let her you know, calm down, uh, you know, and then uh, do an embryo, frozen embryo transfer cycle uh, for her. This was work by uh, Ibrahim Wada, who is from Nigeria, working in Cambridge with us at the time, and, and did one of the earlier studies on uh, elective cryopreservation in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, aspiration the follicles were thought to be very helpful, but indeed it does not make a significant difference. One of the papers by uh, Professor Abulgar. And then albumin was a big thing. In albumin, that uh, was, was a big ev event. In, in, in 1991, Ricardo Ash, who was working at UC Irvine, th suggested that, um, that giving albumin at the time would eliminate OHSS. And then there were the Cochrane database was, was, was submitted in 2002 in Oxford in England and showed that seven clinical trials confirming the, uh, the advantage. One additional trial was added to, to, uh, from, the, um, from Valencia in Spain by IDI, one of the largest groups in Europe, and they confirmed that there was no difference really with the albumin. Albumin might help, but, but, it, but you cannot count on it. It will not be your salvage. I mean, it will, it will not really make the difference between life and death, but it could ameliorate the disease. The, the thinking is that albumin would tie in some of the VEGF, so, so the VEGF would not be free to act. Uh, again, it's a separate to, to topic, but VEGF has different, um, has different kind of isomers. So there is VEGF A, B, and C, and D. And then there are three receptors, VEGF receptor 1, VEGF receptor 2, VEGF receptor 3. And then it's VEGF A, when it attaches to receptor 2, is the most stimulant for OHSS. So this led the thought that all these treatments have been relying on what? on just changing HCG doing this, but nobody has addressed the real issue. The real issue is what? Is that HCG causes VEGF. Can you manipulate that? Can you work on the disease itself? So this was the first work that was done from, <coughs> from uh, the group in Spain, from Antonio Pelissé. And this was actually submitted to the ASRM, and uh, you know, I had the, the, uh, the great pleasure of, of being on the committee to review it, and definitely we gave it the prize. 
they said, okay, what is the problem? The problem is that ACG works on the ovary. The ovary produces the EGF. And like I said, there is A, B, C, D, the A works, attaches to a receptor called receptor 2, and then causes the capillaries to, di to dilate. Dilate means what? The endothelial cells just s go further away from each other, allows the, the plasma to leak through. So they said, okay, if we make a drug that blocks that receptor, then we could potentially prevent OHSS. So they made a drug for the purpose of the study was SU5416, but that drug blocked the VEGF receptor 2. The, v, the, 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 the second type of receptor, like I said, there are three. Number two is the one that is, allows you to, to go into capillary dilatation and so on. So a VEGF receptor 2. So they made that drug, and the drug indeed, when given in a preliminary study in red, abolished ovarian hyperstimulation. So it's a great success. It is. So what is the limitation? The limitation that pregnancy itself relies on VEGF to, for the pregnancy to continue. I mean, how can you have a baby whose crown rump is uh, 18 millimeter tomorrow becomes 54 and tomorrow and so I mean, you cannot do that unless you have continuous VEGF going up, opening the vessels. How, how does the placenta eat in the wall of the uterus and how does the blood work? All that relies on simply on VEGF among others, but VEGF is the major player in about 60%. So if you block it, the pregnancy will stop at a certain point. So the, but the study was an eye-opening study. It uh, was published uh, about 12 years now. Uh, the, <coughs> the second uh, step they did, which was also another ingenious step, they said, okay, let's take it step by step. So here is in the purple, the VEGF, and then uh, this is the its receptor, what we call receptors 2, and this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the granulosa cells represented by each one of those. And then on another side totally, this is the dopamine receptor. And if I press one more time, you have the VEGF attaching to what? To its receptors. The VEGF attaches to receptor. What happens? The blood vessels open and you have capillary dilatation. Well, here, if you give the patient dopamine agonist represented by the blue triangles in the right corner and then give them the agonist, the agonist will attach to what? To the dopamine agonist receptors. And the two of them will not block the receptor totally, but will internalize the receptor, decreasing its amount, so you do not have vascular permeability, which was really an ingenious idea. They came to it based on several basic science studies that shows what upregulates and what downregulates <coughs> the receptor. So they found that dopamine agonist downregulates the receptor. They worked out that this is the mechanism. So what is the commonest dopamine agonist that we use now is Dostinex. And they did a clinical trial that they use a small dose of Dostinex. How much? About half a milligram used daily from the day of the ACG for eight days, and they showed that in it indeed, they tried it first on egg donors. Why egg donors? Because you can do the study without worrying that they will get pregnant themselves, because they are the, you know, the ones their, their treatment ends, the egg goes to, to somebody else. So they took egg donors who had 30 follicles or so, had more than 20 eggs, and randomized them. Half of them took the cabergolin or the dostin X, half a milligram, um, for eight days, and then the other half took nothing. And they showed that there is a tremendous difference in what? In really the amount of moderate ascites. It did not make a difference in severe ascites. So, so again, keep that in mind. So now we're, we're having bits and pieces. We can use some albumin, we can use Dostinex, but none of those will abolish the, um, the, the, uh, the stuff, the, uh, the, ovarian the severe ovarian hyperstimulation completely. Does it impact implantation or not? So they were courageous enough after the preliminary study that was done on egg donors, and they used it on, uh, on, on just regular patients, and they showed there was no negative impact of cabergolin on, um, on the live birth rate in, OH, in, 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 in IVF pregnancies. So I want to conclude here and then give you a couple of uh, things about uh, the treatment. The, 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 the conclusion here is the following, is that OHSS is preventable in the majority of cases. Why is it preventable? Because really, uh, the majority of them are excessive stimulation in sensitive patients or normal stimulation in hypersensitive patients, which you can avoid. VEGF is definitely the major mediator. It's not the only mediator. It is <coughs> it's involved in about 70% of the cases. If you stop the ACG with holding, it is successful. I mean, you will not get ovarian hyper, at least severe ovarian hyperstimulation. But it's very frustrating for a patient who's been through two months of treatment and paid so much for the medication and so on. If you have no other options, we'd still recommend that. 
Costing is definitely successful, but if you have costing for many days, like I mean, costing for a week to, to bring them down to seven days, it has been our experience that, that the pregnancy rate goes down to less than, than, than 10 percent in those cases. However, there has been two large trials done, in, one in London and one in, in, in Egypt, and both of them showed that costing even for five, four days or more did not negatively impact uh, hyperstimulation syndrome. Controversial is whether treatment with birth control for three weeks prior to that would decrease OHSS. We use it not because of OHSS, we use it because it prevents cyst formation and also the patients are not pregnant when you give them the Lupron. We've had several patients that were pregnant when we started on their own when we started the fertility Low dose gonadotropin is probably the, the key issue, that if you use high dose, you will have a higher chance. If you use the highest dose, you will have the highest chance. There is no question about that. You can use an antagonist protocol to, to, to prevent the surge rather than an agonist protocol, and, and we'll talk about that another time. But if you use an antagonist protocol, it allows you to trigger ovulation using G and RH agonist and not HCG. And then finally, definitely, if you, if you, HCG is a great support for the TL phase, but is probably more inducive to ovarian hyperstimulation. So if you we need to support the luteal phase, which we do, then you use progesterone rather than the HCG, at least in patients who are, um, who are prone to have hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, what is the cutoff? I mean, definitely, I mean, you can have a cutoff of, of, of for example, 2,000. You can lose HCG if, you're, uh, if your E2 was less than 2,000. How do we manage it? So now all this happened, you have done all you can, and today the patient shows up on, 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 in, on your emergency room with ascites down here. There is, there is really two things. There is monitoring, there is medical treatment, there is surgical treatment. So for monitoring, what do we do? We check the fluid uh, input and output. We check the three, the three groups of tests that I told you, which are the liver functions, kidney functions, as well as the hematology. If a patient is highly hemoconcentrated, means that usually needs fluid, what fluid would come into that? And then, of course, you'll have to do uh, ACG and you'll have to do uh, an ultrasound. Really, invasive hemodynamic monitoring is very rarely used now. So this is as far as monitoring is concerned. What about medical treatment and surgical treatment for OHSS? Medical treatment will really focus on two words, anticoagulants and, um, and fluid management. Anticoagulants basically is, is, is a key. We used to think that anticoagulants is very necessary if the women have th thrombosis confirmed or have immu uh, something, one of your famous one, antithrombin 3, thrombin factor mutation, or, or factor 5 line. Now we have moved that even patients with moderate hyperstimulation at least should be considered for, monitor, for, for anticoagulants uh, as well. Fluids is very important. Two schools of thought, there is the dry school and the wet school. We tend, I mean, you know, t basically you hydrate them or not. I believe that you should hydrate them to a certain degree. The more you hydrate them, the more they will push fluid out again. Uh, the, the hydration fluid in, in, in different parts of the world are different. So in the U.S., it's usually electrolytes at the beginning, and if electrolytes fail, uh, colloids. In, in, the, in the United Kingdom, they never use electrolytes for that. Only colloids are given for the, for the fluid management of uh, hyperstimulation syndrome. Finally, two very important words, never use diuretics in those patients. Is if you use diuretics, because those patients come with fluid here and so on, it's the standard management in other disciplines in medicine like nephrology and gastroenterology and so on, that if, those, if they have a patient with lots of effusion and so on, the first thing they get, 20 of Lasix as part of the, the standard orders on the, on the floor. I mean, this will put them immediately into extremely high risk of strokes. I mean, this is what has precipitated strokes in most of the of the qu cases that has either been reported or has gone to court is that those patients given diuretics and then suddenly you have a middle cerebral artery within th 20 to 30 minutes of your diuretics. Dopamine is a drug that is now given in a different format as a treatment for patients in the, uh, basically in the intensive care with, with low kidney perfusion. And I'll come to that again. Surgery, the patients for a surgery will, will, that you will have is basically patients who have bleeding or who have their ovaries torsed and so on. So let me give you some examples of uh, treatment. When do you hospitalize? If the patient, for example, is vomiting every minute at home, so she can keep fluids down. The, if the patient is, is producing zero urine, if she has massive ascites, if she is this thing, I mean, abnormally, I mean, she cannot, I mean, you know, if her blood pressure is very low, 
if she has hyponatremia or hyperkalemia, these are the two, and they bring them sometimes on the uh, Kriog test and so on. I mean, they bring specifically that the sodium is low and the potassium is high, so when they ask you what are the electrolyte disturbances associated, I mean, there is usually one or two questions. It's not a common topic, but it's definitely a topic in, in the, uh, the Kriog, and the question is always about electrolytes and so on, because this is part that you can uh, impact the outcome. Again, these are the monitoring that we said, the three words, kidney function, liver functions, and uh, hematology. How do, you, how do you measure how much fluid do you, you, you take? Basically, you measure fluid by, by their body weight. If somebody put on tw 20 pounds more in one week than it is, hematocrit, most important, most, most single, most important. So hematocrit, for example, over 60, 70 is pretty serious. Definitely over 50 is very high. Abdominal girth. And then, of course, a fluid chart, just a simple fluid chart. Actually, fluid charts is the most difficult to obtain in, uh, in, in a hospital setting. I mean, to get an accurate fluid chart, I mean, simply, I mean, addition and subtraction is... Uh, is, is challenging and so on. So, so, so if, you, if, you, if you, I mean, I promise you, if you try to do on any of your patients, you know, just a regular fl fluid chart in every day in the hospital, it is more difficult than, than doing, you know, her surgery. Uh, <laughs> be, 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 because shifts and then reported and they tell you, no, no, this was from 12 to 9 in the morning. I didn't mean it was from 8 to 8. And then suddenly there is overlap. I mean, if you get it within a 50 mar percent margin of error, it is, uh, it, it is, it is major. Again, uh, what kind of fluid? This was the Johns Hopkins protocol. One of the former fellows there has, has written a nice article. I mean, basically, a patient comes to the ER, he gives a one liter of normal serine over 60 minutes and then another liter over four hours and so on. And if she does not produce urine, he moves to colloids. Again, in the UK, <coughs> I mean, I give this to talk to, you know, international meetings, so there's people from both sides. They literally... Uh, you know, go on on a, on a total strike with that. I mean, crystals are unacceptable treatments. Uh, you know, it's actually below the standard of care. This is not just a, an option and so on. So they use colloids. Colloids like what? I'll show you in two minutes. Crystalloids, in my opinion, is reasonable as long as you do not, you know, overdo it. If you if you give them excessive amounts, yes, they will get more pleural effusion and they will get more ascites and so on. This was one of the studies from uh, actually from uh, from uh, Israel, from from Abramov. In, in Tel Aviv, he compared two stars. He compared starch, simple starch, six percent starch, versus hemexcel. We do not have hemexcel. It is it is a very common colloid used in Europe, uh, and so on. And basically, he is showing here that th these are the four parameters: the reduction in body weight, reduction in hematocrit, reduction in white count. The white count is high. Not necessary because of infection is part of margination of white count. So there is a reduction in white count, increase in urine output, and duration of hospitalization is severe. They had 20 patients. Basically, there was no difference. So, so, so starch is, is, is a very useful thing. We use starch now because it's simply safe and cheap. Um, you, you can use, so these are the three or four things. Albumin, you know, and you can use albumin 25% or 50%. Very useful. It's very expensive. Uh, starch, very useful, cheap, simple. Uh, theoretically, no chance of viral inf transmission, whereas with albumin, theoretical chance. However, there has not been a single case reported worldwide for albumin viral transmission. Hemexcel is, is used in Europe. We don't have the Hemexcel now. I, I mean, I haven't used it for many years. Uh, anticoagulants, again, definitely if the patient have arterial or venous thromboembolism, then heparin should be used, or uh, heparin is the typical use, but if, if she's at risk, then you can use heparin or you can use lo Lovenox uh, in those patients. The, the criteria has changed. This was based on one uh, publication by uh, Professor Abu Ghar about 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, showing that two cases of moderate hyperstimulation syndrome, and both of them develop cerebral arterial thro uh, thrombosis. So he said that then we should consider anticoagulating all the patients. The challenge is how long? I mean, you anticoagulate her today. I mean, are you going to stay two weeks, four weeks, six weeks? Uh, five months. There is evidence that the, that the effect of the of the uh, hyperstimulation stays up till 20 weeks. So, so you can argue that you want to stay 20 weeks on it. You can argue that you can stay four weeks. We typically stop once the patients become, uh, you know, back to her routine. Back to her routine means normal hematocrit and means that she's mobilizing well. Um, which, which is which usually about four four weeks, but definitely, uh, Lovenox have made things easier because we do not have to monitor at all or uh, as much. 
uh, and so on. I told you when to, to admit her. So finally, diuretic, I'm, I'm just do not give diuretics. The only reason for giving diuretics is pulmonary edema, not pure effusion, pulmonary edema. If they have pulmonary edema, then, I mean, they have to breathe. So, so you have to uh, give them diuretic. And there, there is uh, Daniel Neveau, who is, uh, actually was at uh, NYU, uh, about 25 years ago, did, did a protocol called albumin lasix. So he gives them a high dose of albumin, follow it by the lasix, and, and so, so the albumin get, pushes the fluid intravascular, then the lasix gets rid of the fluid. He's very successful in that. I always invite him to write the, 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 uh, that part of the chapter. But I always also qualify this statement by saying that he has extraordinary expertise in the area. So if this is commonly employed by, by the majority of us where, you know, working in the field, you have very bad outcomes with the same protocol. So his protocol is correct. I'm not challenging it. But, 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 uh, but you, you have to know what you're doing. If, if you fall in between and you give them lasix, they will have strokes and there are many reported cases of strokes in those patients um, as well. Uh, again, <coughs> antihistamines because it, 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 the hyperstimulation is kind of an allergic reaction but the antihistamines did not work. ACE inhibitors were tried, they did not work. Antibiotics are very frequently needed because many of those patients are catheterized, many of them have IP lines, many of them have uh, low immunoglobulins because some of the immunoglobulins get also lost, not just the albumin, it's typically albumin which gets lost, but some of the immunoglobulins as well. Intensive care, you pray and hope that you don't go there. <coughs> if you go, there will be complications simply because of the difference in approaches between the two teams. Pluricentesis is very easily and commonly done and could be done as an outpatient. Uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome certainly needs admission. Pericardiosynthesis, I haven't seen <coughs> anyone in those situations, but there has been two cases reported from London by Peter Brinsden, and he did pericardiosynthesis on them. Uh, again, th embolism and or thrombosis, and those patients need anticoagulants. Dopamine, <coughs> this is dopamine for renal failure in those patients, and there were two studies. Anna Pia Ferraretti from Italy did a study in Bologna in 1992 and she was successful in regaining kidney functions and then another group, Sonado from Japan did the same study but using do docarpamine and also was successful. So dopamine is uh, useful as well. Finally, <coughs> if you have uh, a patient going to the OR, then you really need to warn the anesthesia. You want the anesthesia, why? Because the patients have pleural effusion, they don't breathe well. They are severely hemoconcentrated. They have restricted IV access. They are highly prone to infections and febrile morbidity. Positioning in surgery is challenging because the massive ascites and the large overs. Thrombophilias are common in those patients. Pelvic masses are common, so the venous return is worse. Ascites is common. Electrolyte disturbances, particularly hyponatremia, are common. So you have to tell anesthesia these are the issues that you tell them and as early as you can. If you have ovarian torsion, it usually happens not in the most severe case. It happens in the moderate cases because the severe cases, the ovaries are so big, so there is no room to torsion. There is no torsion ever reported in somebody who has a 40 centimeter over. But if the ovary is 8, 10, 12, 14, then they can twist around their pedicle very easy. The ovaries probably twist and untwist normally many times. If you do, then the treatment is laparoscopy and detorsion. The removal, the treatment is not removal of the ovaries. You do not remove the ovaries because they are torn. Even if they are bluish, echimotic, and all that, the blood comes back again and again and again. This was done by, 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 uh, <coughs> by Professor Mashiach from, from Israel. He did a major study uh, on 154 patients, and, and, and he showed year after year that they, do, um, that they did laparoscopic detorsion and was successful in that. Again, this was one of our patients with ascites, and you can see that you can tap the ascites through the uh, cul-de-sac. So I finally leave you with, the, with, with, uh, with the, this slide, that if you, if, you, if, you, if you have those patients, you only operate if they bleed or if they have torsion or if they have a concomitant ectopic that ruptures. I mean, you, to have OHSS with ectopic alone is very rare, but you could. I mean, but, but, but you can have a heterotopic, like pregnancy inside and outside and hyperstimulation, pretty tricky. Um, and, and, and you try to go laparoscopic, although you have that. Sometimes it's impossible. I mean, we had some, somebody two years ago, I try, I mean, I know that she, she, she ruptured the cyst. So I tried, I mean, you, if you go laparoscopic and get enough distension high up here, you can suction the fluid and, and just uh, be, but sometimes it's impossible to do the pneumoperitoneum. So you open up and you oversaw the edge. You don't take things out because the more you take, the more they bleed and so on. You just oversaw some of those <coughs> edges uh, as well. And I thank you for your attention this morning. I think I'm still within time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you.